Um, we are very, very lucky to have Jean here. And so, Jean, with that introduction, um, can you talk about what you're doing now, now that you're retired? <laughs> no, you cannot use the R word. <laughs> I am totally allergic to the R word. In fact, it's Valerie who's helping me by saying refiring. So I'm saying I'm refiring and I'm inspiring. I'm really allergic. I am not, I cannot imagine that R word applying to me. Nor can it, since I have to continue to work to make up for my excesses. Well, let me tell you what I am. <laughs> now that Janice has outed me, I'm like 40. Isn't that, I think it's disgusting. <laughs> and it took me that long to let go of the day to day. So in February, for the first time in that many years, uh, I let go of, of the day to day at Starvest, which is my firm that I founded with three other amazing people uh, back in 98-99. And uh, it's an expansion stage. We raised $400 million over the years. And it's an expansion stage investing group where we look for companies that have, in a perfect world, uh, 2 to 15 million top line revenue. And, uh, and we like to invest in that BC round. So uh, I became a special advisor in February and started, and I tell this to you to try to make you laugh. It certainly makes me laugh. The Sullivan Golf, Travel, and Speaking Tour. <laughs> I wear long sleeves when I play, but last week I didn't have long sleeves on, so here's part of my goal. <laughs> and let me tell you, just as uh, Julie said earlier, she, and I love this when you said this, Julie, seven, uh, she had a hundred hours of Ruby on Rails, another technology effort. I can hear the you, if you work on your golf game like I have, I've had 75 days, I'm going for 100, <laughs> 75 days of practice and play. You can actually be a better golfer. <laughs> and I have achieved that goal. And I'm so excited because, see, my three brothers are all scratch golfers. So I actually believe it's in my DNA to be a good. I am good for a girl. I am not great. I want to be a great golfer. And I can tell you that if you do something, uh, technology work, build your business, uh, raise your kids with diligence for a repeated period of time with thoughtfulness, you can actually improve. And boy, does that turn me on. <laughs> and uh, so I share that just uh, really to make you laugh. But this is our year of glorious living, and I share this also very humbly with you. So all my life, you know, I just work like a dog. In February, uh, I went to, uh, to Sedona, Arizona, and I, which I love. If any of you ever been there, my grandmother moved there 40 years ago, so I've been going there that long. It's, it's incredible if you've never been there. It's the Red Rock country, you know, where they <clears throat> did all those uh, Kaba, Kaba movies, and it's so beautiful. So I uh, played golf, and I have one more piece to tell you about that later, and hiked, you can hike those Red Rocks, and worked, you know, I'm on the computer half the day, you know, just trying to do some things. And uh, then, again, I share this humbly, we came home, uh, swapped out the clothes, did a hundred loads of laundry, got an airplane, and I went to London, which I love. Have you all been to London? Because what a city. Oh. And uh, I met up with Valerie, and that's how she is the one who introduced me to Janice, and that's one of the reasons I'm here, as well as next week at that wonderful conference you all are putting on. And uh, I got to speak at a conference that Valerie was very instrumental in putting on called Power Shift, for women by women. Oh, it was so vibrant, fabulous. And that was a preamble to us spending, you ready? A month in Paris. <laughs> 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 a month in Paris. I've never done anything like that in my life. Do you know how thrilling that was? Only I missed my goal. My goal was to understand Paris like New York. Forget it. It is so complicated, <laughs> so big, so, you know, so unique, a coquille, as you know, not grids, uh, you know, and uh, so that was thrilling. And then we came home, and then we went right to Newport, Rhode Island, where my husband's family is from. And I, I grew up in the Midwest, and I tell them all the time, I'm so glad you're from Newport instead of Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, okay, enough of that. Because let me tell you what I'm really doing. Um, I, as I introduce myself, I am dedicated, I'm passionate about supporting entrepreneurs, especially women, 
and a few good men. I will speak to a few men if I know they're in the good camp. Uh, and I'm delighted that you got so many men here. I, I praise you for that. Okay. So, so uh, let's break the men too. No, no, no. Why is that? Why would I be so focused on what? And here's what happened to me. Five years ago, uh, I went to my first, I was asked to speak at the We Own It Summit, which is something that Astia uh, had uh, put on for the last several years. And Astia is just a made up name, you may know it. You know, it's a group out of California, 15 years old. They really uh, work to empower women entrepreneurs. And I'm on their board of trustees, and it's really a terrific group. And by the way, my commercial, commercial message for these other wonderful groups is, is the same. Uh, if I'm not involved in one of these women groups that help empower, I go and say, how come I'm not involved with you? I need you, and you need me. And, and that's why I'm here. I'm here because I get more out of this than I give back, for sure. I loved what I learned today. Uh, inspiring, uh, great ideas, well articulated, uh, hungry for knowledge and connections and making it happen, that's inspiring back to me. So uh, so I went to the first one, I was rolling my eyes, like, what is this? What is this woman thing? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what made me stay, what or go in the first place? I was, guess I was kind of curious. But by the time the conference was over, I left getting it. Because you know what I realized? I've been on Mars. I'm the oldest of eight kids. I had a mother who said I could do anything I wanted to do, and I believed her. And I uh, have always been a male dominant physicist. I had no idea about really the struggles, the hardships, how few women get funded, how hard it is, few women on boards, what's that? So I got it. And here's what I really got. I became a student of the research about what is this. You may have heard me or others tell the story. It's one of my favorite stories. I didn't know what I'm about to tell you. The gender bias starts, this is why the men need to listen to this too. The gender bias starts in grade school. Uh, they, the research shows it starts about third or fourth grade. If a girl gets a bad grade in one of the STEM uh, fields, science, math, whatever, she says, I'm not good at this, and drops back. You know what a guy says? A guy says, the teacher's stupid, and I need to learn this. Now here's why it's important for you as men to understand that you are the fathers, the uncles, the brothers of the young girls and boys who need to understand this. I was with a young gal this weekend at a wedding. She's nine years old, adorable. She said, I hate math. I said, wait a minute, let's talk. And I turned her, tried to turn her, from saying she hates math, it's not about the grade, it's not about liking math, it's about what you can do with it. Her dad, you know, runs a simulation program, has a great job, you know, her, her you know, all kinds of, if you want to build an iPhone app, you want to uh, lead a business, so it's about that, what you can do with it. So I am really turned on by that. And then I started becoming more of a student of the research, that women today are seven trillion dollars purchasing power just in the US. It's 28 trillion worldwide. Okay, but we're like nowhere with our voice and playing, leading a company if we wanted to or being on a board if we wanted to, all that. So I became really fascinated with that. And I do think, and I had this conversation earlier, uh, it's gonna take uh, about two more generations because here's what's happening. The uh, our husbands, not our uh, fathers or grandfathers, but our husbands and our sons that we are spawning are either married to uh, great women who are dynamic or have daughters. They want the daughters to succeed. That's where the sea change is. I'm seeing it before my eyes. They come to me. Will you talk to my daughter? Will you meet with her? Will you give her a job? Will you fund her company? And that's how it's changing, because you want your daughters to succeed. And you want your boys to understand this whole gig. OK, enough of all that. I just wanted to share that, because I am passionate about it. And that's what brings me here. Uh, I really care. And, I, and there's a great group of us now that have these years and experience behind us, and we do care. And wow, that's how it's going to change. 
all of us helping, connecting, we need the men to do that too. It's the men who can help fund us, support us, uh, help us be successful, help us in our failures, and help connect us. Do you know the research also shows that the business networks of women and men don't even talk to each other? They're completely different. So just you know, understanding all this gives me that insight, and, and hopefully you too. Anyway, all right. So uh, uh, I don't mean to rattle on, but I did want to share a few things uh, back on today. So, um, so talk to me about what you're seeing right now in terms of what's going on in other companies and different things that are interesting and yeah. changes that you see. Yeah, there is so much vibrancy. Uh, uh, I, uh, I mean, that's why I wanted to come here as an example. Well, what, what is Janice building here and what is this? And I mean, I'm blown away by that innovation. And that is so exciting. There's innovation all through this whole New York Metro corridor. That is thrilling for us. It's the first time. Because I've been investing here since 1990 as a venture capitalist. And uh, all of our companies were either Silicon Valley or 128 Corridor. Because there was nothing here. Now there's a lot here. That's cool. And so that breeds success. It's a tech center. And now there's, uh, it, because of what's happened in corporations, a, a lot of people who have either made it as entrepreneurs or as corporate executives have jumped out, such as many people in this room, and have started businesses or are fueling businesses. That's <coughs> what we need. And certainly we're way behind on all the numbers from Silicon Valley, but we're really making some progress. And not until we have some real exits, which we don't have, you know, we don't have the IPOs, we don't have the uh, huge exits, many, but not certainly uh, enough, but that's growing. So this is thrilling, we're in the right place, right time, it's very thrilling, and who doesn't want New York, you know? So we see a lot of migration from California coming here, a lot of, uh, there's a dearth of engineers, they know that. A lot of uh, technical talent is starting to come here, and Bloomberg was so smart to just build what he did with Technion, starting that engineering piece. So the more and more of a tech center we can make this, the better. There are some of the you know, and when, because we're in Connecticut, sometimes we feel like we don't get some of that technology often. What I really just started noticing just in the past several months is more and more New Yorkers coming to Connecticut. And even with next Friday, right, with our Connecticut Celebrates Women Entrepreneurs, I mean, Gene's coming in to moderate a conversation around what do investors look for. Deborah Jackson, who's the CEO of Plum Alley, is coming in to talk about crowdfunding. Anna Rivanona is actually flying in from Paris to uh, talk about and interview what, it, what it's like to be a, a woman entrepreneur. So I think finally Connecticut is getting some attention. I think it, you know, us uh, getting the grant, we were one of two uh, organizations in New England to actually receive the SBA grant. So I think that's a really good sign for Connecticut. And I think we really need to broaden that tri-state New York stuff. And that's why it's so important to us when people like Jean come into Connecticut and work with us. Um, so Jean, you talked to a lot of women. I was at the Summit. Summit. You were amazing in that. And we actually both saw um, the young woman from Little Bits talk. And she was incredible. Yeah. Um, Talk, talk a little bit about what do you, advice do you give women in, in raising money? And sure. What I, what I like to bounce through are just some of the, everything from uh, the silly things that women do. Now, guess what? Guys do this too. But it's just so much more glaring than a woman does or doesn't do these things. So I have a few kind of headlining things that I like to emphasize. But I heard a lot of good articulation today. Um, really good. Because here's some of my hot buttons. One is just telling the story. Get it out of your mouth. You know? <laughs> I hate that. Many a time I've sat in a meeting, 15 minutes later, I have no clue what the product or service truly is. So really articulating what the what is it? And I thought I heard many good stories today. Certainly, uh, 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 you know, you heard it with me. Uh, uh, good streets. You know, that was so interesting. You know? Got good response from the group. Not to say, what are you doing? Why? You know, uh, one of my markers for screwing that up, and this happens all the time, uh, is uh, in the first minute of a one-hour conversation, 
I want to show you again. That to me is a marker because for uh, somebody who's really hung up on the product and the feeds and speeds of the product, more excited about all those piece parts than what's the big picture. Uh, and then uh, something that is, uh, uh, you know, often left out. No, no page in the PowerPoint on what's the, uh, what even is the business model? You know, what's the pricing, possible pricing structure? And uh, what's really the marketing plan? I'll hear a whole freeze on nothing on the go-to-market plan. I heard plenty of that today. Well done. And the competitive differentiation. Uh, you know, who, okay, one of the biggest questions people always ask me that I work with teams on are, where am I going to find my angels? Who are your angels? I find a lot of, especially women, uh, have no clue. Now, this is what guys do really well. They've been, you know, throwing baskets on uh, Saturday morning with these guys, going to their buddies and saying, hey, who funded you? Get me a meeting. Do you know the research shows that if a woman's best friend could fund her as an angel or an investor, she wouldn't even go to her and ask her. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing when you realize things. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, but guys are quick and ready to say, hey, get me in front of that dude, you know? And so uh, knowing how to approach somebody and who might be interested is a skill that can be learned. It's one of my signature lines. You can learn this stuff. And uh, so I think connecting in, uh, helping each other. Now there's more and more angel groups, and there's more and more groups focused on women-led companies. We've named many of them today, and uh, I think they're, they're doing fabulous work. Uh, so that's one of them. And then the team. Now I was talking about this today with, with Pamela. Uh, you don't want to look like a one-man band. Now today it's OK to look like a one-man band, but not tomorrow. And so a lot of times you might not even think about this. Stub out the functional roles. Hey, over the next year, I need to hire these people, and I have my binoculars on to find them. And as soon as Joe Blow, you know, as soon as we get funded, Joe Blow is going to join us. And he, you know, was a top producer at this company. So that's how you do it. And then always have uh, a good lawyer. These lawyers are anxious for your business. They won't charge you a fortune in the early days. Great law firms. They want your business. They give you a package. Uh, that you can start with. And uh, so put the lawyer's name. That adds gravitas. Vince, do you disagree with that? I see you laughing. <laughs> uh, and the, uh, the lawyer and your accounting firm, that adds gravitas. And then, guess what else? Your advisory board. If you've got some known names and somebody hears, oh, Tori Birch is on my advisory board, that makes people stand back. So that advisory board can add gravitas to your team. And I, 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 you know, that's easy. None of that costs anything. And, and so I think that's the way to really build out. And then my biggest hot button is this. Uh, the ability to be fluent in the financials. This is where women really screw up. I just want to slap your faces. <laughs> Somebody said that to me. Have you ever slapped anybody? So here's what happens. So we're in a meeting. It's gone pretty well. And I've heard all these things. Hey, maybe in a good way. And somebody says, I, I, hey, we got funded last year to, you know, 600000 And uh, I say, well, you know, was it debt or equity? Oh, it was equity. Well, what was the pre-money valuation? A blank stare. Blank stare. Meetings over, we'll look at the next one. I want you to be fluent in issues around valuation, of uh, debt and equity, uh, around uh, uh, what's the top line growth look like? What are the capital needs of the business? This is a true story. Last week I was on the phone mentoring somebody. She has a PhD from Harvard. She had an undergrad from Caltech, and she had a master's degree. School. Oh, this ought to be interesting. <laughs> I said, what are the capital needs of the business? This is after 15 minutes. I don't really know. Okay, that's all right. That's okay. She's up for that. Well, how much are you raising now? 
$20,000. You see, all those degrees, it didn't matter. She needed to become fluent in the finance, financing of the business. And I said, well, aren't you going to hire somebody? Yes. Oh, she said, I forgot to add it back. <laughs> I'm like astonished. I'm going, oh my God, and I'm getting her ready for a pitch that she's going to do. I said, okay, girlfriend, you call me back next week. You know, let's, let's try again. So, you know, we need each other is the point. And being able to be fluent in the financing part is critical. Your top line, capital needs over time. What are the gross margins? That's important because most people who invest are financial focused. You'll find they're not necessarily tech savvy uh, or certainly not market savvy in your domain, but they are financially focused. They want to know that and they will just skewer you. You will not get the next meeting if you can't look smart and sound smart. Now here's my, my line again. You can learn this stuff. It's not hard. It's actually simple math. It's not hard. And, uh, and you can also help yourself by having the smartest person uh, at your side. If let's say it's not your thing, and you can put them at your side in the meeting and let them speak to those things and then learn from them. So that's how you do it. Now guys somehow instinctively know how to do this. You guys kind of do this naturally, even if you didn't grow up in the financial world. But somehow you know the stuff, because guess what? You said the teacher was stupid and you paid attention. <laughs> and, it, and there's so many books and things online to teach you this. So there's no excuse for not being financially fluent. And the other fluence, fluency piece is the technology. If you're not the technical co-founder, uh, but you are the CEO, you've got to learn the technical ropes. Again, it's not that hard. I mean, certainly it's hard to be uh, a savant in it, but that's why you've got your, your CTO. Put him or her at your side. Learn from them. It's not just their role. All right, enough of me. What else can I answer for you? Question. Um, well, first of all, uh, thank you for speaking today, and thank you for uh, remembering me from the first tech bubble. I'm really, really impressed. <laughs> you have a good memory, and you remembered who funded me. And that, that's, that was uh, awesome. I, I saw you as such an early, you know, adopter and ahead of the pack. So it was fun to catch up to you again today. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that's a point for uh, persistence. <laughs> about that. Um, but um, well, and I'll use myself as an example that this doesn't just apply to me, but. Um, I'll put it out there uh, because uh, you know in the in the break uh, you kind of very politely implied that I was underselling myself, which I do tend to do. I think a lot of women tend to do that sometimes, and, and I, so I wanted to know um, how do you how do you, would you recommend kind of bragging about yourself without sounding like you're bragging, which I think particularly for women is hard. Like men can kind of be cocky and it's yeah. sexy, but for women, yeah. it's just sometimes hey, listen, sounds. Having that swag, that is important. It's really part of it. And, and you know, I could just see you standing up there saying, look, I was on the first to the to the market with this kind of uh, business. Uh, I grew it, it got some vibrancy, we got huge media. I've learned from that. Here's the three things I've learned. I'm doing it again, only better and different. Right there, just it states your credentials. Critical. That's why people uh, are quick to state, oh, yes, I was at HBS in 85. <laughs> Guess why they say that? It states their credentials, you know? And uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm not recommending it okay. overall. I'm just saying that's why people say what they say. And so you've got a lot of credentials. Uh, and I think it's, it's great to say people like that. They want experience. Okay. I just want to add to that uh, a little bit, if I may. Um, I've been on Wall Street for 20 years, so it's always me. Sadly, it's me and 15 other guys in the room, or there's two women and 20 guys in the room. So my advice is, when you see guys, if you're ever in a situation to see guys pitch, just watch them and copy them. Copy what the guys do. 
and, and then make it your own. And that goes, that goes for everyone here, too, if, if that makes any sense. They can do it for, for some reason. Um, so you, you touched on something that I think for me is a major insecurity. Um, which is to do with knowing the language of the financials and, and all of that. Um, and I think it's sort of been zero to 60 with just needing to be the everything for the business to get it going, get it off the ground. Um, and as we you know, took in more clients and generated more revenue, there was a need to bring someone else in. Um, and we did hire someone to come in and account with the firm um, to sort of make sure that our P&Ls and all of those things were in order. Um, However, for me, um, it's still a conversation that I go and I meet with them, um, but my husband comes with me and he sort of, you know, his job has him working with lots of numbers and things like that. So he is sort of interpreting the data that they're giving and I'm, I'm there and I'm going, do we make a profit? Do we make a, do we make a profit? Um, so I, I mean, I guess, how do you go about making yourself um, someone who really can can use that language and do it confidently without um, you know making it seem as, as if you're an expert when you're really not and then you're going to get tripped up by someone who can sense that you know it's yeah. such a thank you for being vulnerable and so uh, open about it and I hear what you're saying but it's really not that hard. And so what I would do if I were in your shoes is I'd make my husband sit down with me and, yeah. and put it into my brain and have some fun with it. If he's somewhat teacherist, maybe he's not. And if he's not, find somebody else. No, he's good and he okay. doesn't tell me these are the things. No, okay. <laughs> so now make him, you should be the one now with the books. And you can get, are you the CEO? Yes. Okay. So now practice with him uh, uh, I've had to do that with plenty of CEOs and uh, meaning showing them hey state these things in this way so you try and and uh, and uh, package yourself around the financial reporting and see how he does with with him as an audience what were you gonna say um, I was just gonna suggest maybe using something that's real so don't yeah. think of it as amorphous as the business which is developing, but yeah. look at your finances that you're going to talk about some equity or your house or your overhead cost or what you project so that you can do it in a more free-flowing way and then build up your confidence and then shift into a topic that may be. Well, also, go ahead. I just want to add that you know one of the objectives of this program is to do that. So Jen Gabler, who I'm so lucky to have as a co-founder, is the CFO type. And so I work with her on other companies where Literally, the CEO could not talk to me about her financials at all. And after working with Jen for nine months, talks to me as a CEO today. She knows her numbers, she knows her capital requirements, she knows what she's doing. And it really is not rocket scientist, it's right. just what Jean says, yeah. becoming familiar with it and not just giving it off to your husband. I don't and know so why it feels intimidating. Well, it does. Like, yeah, I think I it's a myth. Not Maybe not Jen can answer well, the question. Maybe a myth. You're the one who knows your business the best. And basically, it's taking your operational knowledge and translating it into numbers. So when I hear you tell me about your business or anyone here, like my, I see a spreadsheet. And so it's basically, and your assumptions about what you know goes into your business, like is your this job profitable? You know better than anyone what you need to use on that job, how much manpower, how much materials, and it's just translating those into costs and top line. And then, so if you're comfortable with the assumptions, and that's what a lot of the venture people are going to pick at, because if they see a bunch of numbers on the screen, they'll say, well, what's behind that? And make, make sure that the numbers are grounded in react and yeah. valid assumptions. So, and then you go and you work from there. But if you start with just a single job, and then your, your business is basically a series of those. Um, and I think and we'll work together. <laughs> Here's another idea for you. I would break it down into manageable piece parts. And I was going to say, I like what you said, Jim, that even if you taught yourself or became proficient in Excel, 
that alone, that's kind of the, the way to figure out what's going into the numbers, as Jen said. And then I would sit down with either your husband or with somebody knowledgeable who's a finance professional and walk you through what is a P&L. You're probably astonished by all those numbers on a piece of paper. But if somebody said, here's what the top line is, here's what the OPEX is, here's what's in that, here's what gross margin is and why that math, math guess what, this is not algebra, it's not geometry, it's not calculus, it is simple math. So if you understood what is going into each one of those line items on your P&L and then on your balance sheet, and then he explained what a cash flow statement is, you would start to demystify and become comfortable. I would also I would also encourage you to see what resources are on the internet. There's amazingly free stuff out there that's yes. really well told, whether it's Khan Academy and other right. other websites like that. If you looked up some of the basics of financing and, and income statements and balance sheets, you could learn a lot in a couple of days. Indeed, that's important. And just like my golf game, if you do something every day or often, right. you can improve. If you did an hour a day, an hour a week, that's that's 52 hours in a year where you're gonna take yourself up the curve. And I'm encouraging you. Yeah, I would say, just gonna add one more point about that too, so I'm on the West Fork Board of Finance. There are plenty of men that don't understand the numbers either. So it's not just a woman right. thing. There are plenty of men that don't get it. And what we say is that it is all by just practice. Just keep seeing the numbers, keep seeing the numbers. You will get it, you will understand it. And so um, it's just, it's really not rocket scientists, it's just practice. I had a question on a somewhat different topic, but um, one area that we've been exploring is the um, new form of the benefit company in Connecticut. And so one uh, question that I've been going around asking at many different places is uh, how does that affect um, people who might invest in the, in the business do you have any of your thoughts on that sort of format of what investors, um, do they look at it um, mutually, positively, negatively, what, what would they think? And do you mean uh, what you're offering your employees? Or what no, it says new form of a corporation of benefit. Oh, oh that's right, that's right, that's right. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I certainly have read about it. We haven't ever invested in any of those, but I, I, I don't know enough to really give you a good comment on but what do you think? Well, it's a great question. I think we're all trying to figure out because the way it, it actually goes live October 1st in Connecticut. And so what it means is that a company's mission statement um, has much of a priority as the investor in, in the company. So that the mission statement can't take a back burner to the investor. So they can always stay within the mission statement. So the, the question around, and I think everybody's asking that, is if you're a benefit corporation, what do investors really believe in? And maybe that limits you to only social venture investors versus other investors. We don't know the answers to that, but Eric gave a comment. No, I, I don't, this is new to me. Oh. Um, why do, and maybe I missed it because I was trying to look it up on, on uh, the internet real quick to see what this thing is. Why does a firm pick that? Um, why do you want to be a benefit corporation? Because A, you have a very specific, probably social venture mission that you want to stick to and not have compromised by your investors. Well, in the and C Corp, you have a yeah. fiduciary duty yeah. to, to follow right. the numbers. Right. You know, with the B Corp, you can have right. an alternative mission which can be weighted in, in, in the way that the, right. the board wants it to be weighted. Right. I mean, Jen and I were looking at it also as an alternative for what, the refinery. I think we're going to stick with being a not-for-profit. Not I think that's where we're going instead of being a corporation. But I think, you know, there's. And we will have, I think, uh, an attorney come in and talk about that. We, Bill Kilgallen talked a little bit about that. He was sort of anti-D corpse, but we'll have somebody else talk about it and, yeah. and see what they say. But it is a good question from an investor standpoint. I don't think we've got some answers now. You know, there's actually a woman in the city who was a guest speaker for me last, uh, you know, last year at yeah. SVA who's wonderful. I, I, oh, can, I can get that. That would be awesome. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah, I'd like to hear more about it, but to me, isn't it? As an investor or as an entrepreneur, it would scare me because yeah. what if I've got to pivot my company and change where I'm going? Yeah. Yeah. It could, could be a real problem. I know. I know. I think that's one of our concerns. I think yeah. one of the challenges I face as I've gone to raise venture money is a lot of these LPs want to see some sort of return. And depending on the structure of your corporation, S versus C, it's a question of when do you take the loss? Do you take the loss immediately and then 
you can mark it up, or do you only take the loss at the end of the exit? You know, when when an LP's lockup of four to seven years is gone, it could hinder your ability to raise additional money. Um, so I actually was originally targeting a partnership or a uh, I can't remember which one. And I spoke to my lawyers, I spoke to a few financial folks, and they said, if you want to raise venture capital in the next year, most of the funds will not want to write a check because then they have to take a loss and show that to their LPs. So it, the biggest irritation would be if you started down that path, you'd have to start over with all new documentation, all new filing, which in and of itself isn't so painful, but it could take you 60 days to get that filing done. And investors, as much as you'd love to hope they love you, they love the company that you could be, and there's a hundred other people banging down their door, so speed to closing a deal is super important. I've lost a couple investors because I took too long. So let me close with just one more story for you. So uh, in Arizona, I had the most fabulous uh, golf pro that I've ever worked with, a woman, of course, and uh, she, she was so great, funny and self-deprecating, quick to say, I'm sure there's plenty of golfers in the room. I said, how come, Heather, uh, you know, last Sunday I just hit the ball great and then next day terrible. She said, that's how it is, you know, that white ball gets down and just, you know, you just blow it. And uh, so the best story she told me in the months we worked together was this. She was out with Sam and Sam uh, was cursing and throwing his clubs and really, really mad. She said, Sam, I know you're paying me for this uh, golf lesson, but I'm not going to take it. What's the matter with you? And uh, he said, Heather, I want to hit the ball like you hit the ball. She said, Sam, you're never going to hit the ball like I hit the ball. You're 70 years old. I'm 43. I've been playing golf all my life. When I was a kid, I played 72 holes a day. Use what you got. And that's my words of inspiration to you. Use what you got, you know? We're never going to hit the ball like Heather, but you, you use what you got and you can make it fly. And I, I'm here to tell you, I heard great things this, today, and I wish you all continued success. Thank you.